Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me today in the locker room. I'm Alan Locker. I believe I met our next guest on his first day in Oakdale. Paul Layden is an Australian American who has worked as an actor, screenwriter, and director for the last 20 years. He made his television, not his television debut, but he made his first appearance as Simon Fraser on As the World Turns back in February 2000. He has a new film, Chick Fight, which he directed and which stars Malin Ackerman, Bella Thorne, and Alec Baldwin, which opens on Friday, November 13th. Paul recently moved, moved to Europe with his wife, actress Alexia Ballier, and their daughter, Raphael. I'm thrilled that he's here today to talk all things Oakdale and tell us about his new film, Chick Fight. Uh, Chick Fight. Damn it. <laughs> Please welcome to the locker room, Paul Layden. Hello there, my friend. Hey, guys. I get You're tongue-tied tongue -tied there, the Alan. I do. I get tongue-tied sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help it. It's probably because we haven't spoken in like, what? Jeez, man, like 20, what's it got to be? When did you leave? Um, wow. All right. So I you started, started in show, 2000. So you started 20 yeah, years ago. I started in the beginning of 2000. I did that through, I did my three years. Then I left. And then about a year later, I think I went back. I did. No, I think I did go back to do a storyline with Terry, of course, that, um, yeah. Which for like six months, I think, you know. So, um, yeah, so that's what, 20, 2004. It's been a while. You look good. You've been working out in quarantine, mate. <laughs> I have been working out in quarantine. <laughs> hey, you wow. got to keep busy. You got to keep busy and make sure you're healthy because, you know, you don't want to get get this horrible thing. And uh... 30, 35 looks good on you. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I wish. How's life over in Europe? Oh, man, it's good. We just, uh, although we did just go back into, so I'm in um, Antwerp at the moment. My wife is the lead of a, a big European TV show that is shooting all across Belgium. <clears throat> so we shot in Brussels for a month. She shot in Austin, What's the name? Because a, we have a lot of people tuning in from Holland. It's called Crossroads. So it'll be on um, France television, uh, like France 2, I think, or Toi, France 2 or, or France 2. Um, it'll be on one of the main German networks and then uh, the main Brussels network, but it'll, I'm sure it'll end up on Netflix eventually too. But it's a beautiful show. It's an incredible show. She's she's killing it. It looks it looks amazing. It's like you know she's playing a a lawyer, a seasoned lawyer turned cop to kind of get in deep into the into the world where her son potentially went missing. So it's you know it's a it's a for her it's it's been challenging because. I've been working because I'm, a, you know, writing full time at the moment on another job. We've got our daughter who's 16 months. It's the first time Alexia has been apart from her. You know, they, they were joined at the hip until this show. So that's been a bit tough on her. Um, but we've got a beautiful nanny with us and all that sort of stuff. So we were in Ostend and now I'm in Antwerp. Then we were meant to go back to Paris next week because we finally got our apartment. Um, but, you know, France has just gone back into lockdown because of some bizarre virus going around you know i'm not sure, yeah. what, I'm, not sure I'm not sure what it is but i'm pretty sure it's ruined 2020. it has uh, ruined 2020. i yeah can we, can we all forget 2020 for sure wow. um paris is my favorite city in the world well you'll have to come visit when uh it when, is, when it all, yeah. all opens back up yeah no, like, I, you know i've been I, I lived in america since i moved from australia i was in america for you know 20 21 years so I did my stint there and I loved it and I and I had a I, you know America opened me with open arms and I had a beautiful friends there and the whole thing but you know I'm looking I'm looking forward to this change especially where America's at so I'm, I'm happy to you know transfer somewhere else I've done my southern hemisphere stint I've done my American stint now I do my European stint so it'll be good yeah, I mean it, it's crazy, but it, it I can't think of a better place to be than Europe, you know. Yeah, I mean again, you know, look I think everywhere in the world right now is 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 hurting. Um, you know, my family is still a lot of my family is still in Melbourne and they they just came out of a lockdown after three, two and a half, three months, and they only had five cases. So I think the you know, they they were determined to get it down to zero cases. 
Um, so, you know, with, with France experiencing all these surges right now, it's not going to be, you know, it's the same across Europe going into, and in, in America going into winter. It's going to be tough. But, you know, we're going to go to Switzerland. For my, my Alexia's dad has a hotel. So we'll go there. He shut the hotel down for a couple of months. So we'll have the run of the hotel and live in, a, live in the shining. And uh, I'll, tr I'll try not to turn old Jack. And uh, with my, you got to video uh, all this for your daughter. I mean, it's you know what a it's life. Amazing, it's amazing. She has been. She has moved since she's since she's been born. We worked out when we came to Antwerp. It was her seventeenth move in uh, in sixteen months. So she's been all over the world. <laughs> oh my God, that's we, crazy. We were so excited to get our apartment in Paris. We were about to move to Paris. We were like, oh, this is going to be her bedroom and we were finally going to give her a, you know, a crib and the whole thing. And then it's gone into quarantine. So we're like, nah, we're not going to Paris. We'll go, we'll go back to the Alps. One of our fans, Marinka, just asked, what language do you speak at home? Uh, well, with uh, uh, English. So Alexia, Alexia's mother was from New Zealand. So oh, Alexia's wow. mom, yeah, she moved to New Zealand when, sorry, she moved to France when she was, you know, I think late 20s, mid 20s, mid 20s. Um, and then met Alexia's dad, who's, a, who's French, and then stayed, had three, three, uh, three kids. So Alexia's born and raised in Paris, but with, a, with an English-speaking, Southern Hemisphere-speaking mom. So it's great. I get along great. Coincidence. Um, what a, it's what awesome. A, yeah, it's awesome. What a coincidence. Because, you know, you know the, the Australians and the New Zealanders have a, you know, similar irreverent sense of humor. So it's, it's, it's rubbed off on my wife, which is amazing. We, we, we laugh all the time. And, and there, there's something about there's the French that are so blunt. They're so honest, which is incredible because you can't get away with anything. You know, Alexa calls me out of my shit all the time, which is great. But she's also got that sense of humor that she gets all my stupid jokes that a lot of Americans didn't even get. So it's cool. No, I, I remember, that's what I remember. You know, I, I said to you backstage, I think uh, I was, you know, in Brooklyn for your first day and we took the car ride back into New York City and it was snowing. But I remember you just using words that I had never heard, you know, you're- I, pro I also probably just slang. made them up. In the, I probably just made them up on the spot just to think that I was <laughs> speaking more. <laughs> so you can talk yeah, I, like, where did you meet Alexia? We met in LA. We met in LA. Um, I was, uh, so my, a really good girlfriend of mine who is, has been a costume designer on a lot of stuff I've, that I've directed. She had just got back from shooting a series in Puerto Rico. <clears throat> and we'd been dying to catch up. We hadn't caught up for ages. And so she had invited me to a party on a Saturday night in Topanga Canyon, which is up in the canyons of, of, of LA. And uh, I, you know, not, not long earlier, I, I was in the midst of, you know, not the prettiest divorce. So uh, I, I'd lost the car, so I only had my motorbike. So I was like, nah, I don't really feel like winding up through the canyons. Even if I have one beer, I don't really want to you know, ride my bike. So I said, look, let's go and have lunch tomorrow. So the next day I got my motorbike, I rode up, saw her, um, and then we went to this restaurant. And as we walked in, my friend Jess was like, oh, there's my friend Zach, um, who had a, his, you know, it was his party last night. Oh, and he's with his friend Alexia. And he, she kept going on and on about Alexia, like, oh, everyone at the party is like, oh, she's amazing, this, that, oh. And uh, I'm like, Jess, just slow your roll. I don't, need to be, I don't need to be set up. I'm pretty good right now. And then we walked over and then we met, I met Zach and there's, there's Alexia talking to Zach's, you know, young daughter. And then Alexia stood up and I was like, you know, I was literally like that wolf in the Looney Tunes cartoons, you know, oh, yeah. where the tongue rolls out and the eyes go, Woo! <laughs> I was floating above them. Like, <laughs> so I, I was just, I've never, I've literally never been, I've never been sort of lost for words. <laughs> and uh, when, I, when I met her, I was, uh, 
I was definitely lost for words. It was love at first sight, at least for me anyway. That's awesome. And and fatherhood? How has fatherhood changed you? Um, God, it's a, it, look, it's it, all the all the things they say is it's true. You know, it definitely it changes your life. I mean, it's uh, you know. There, there are some there are some French people who go, oh, a door, you know, a child you should adjust to your lifestyle, and, you know, should should fit into to you know, it shouldn't change your life that much. I'm like, I don't know how it can, and you know, unless you unless you ignore it. But um, it's been it's been incredible. We have the most. I mean, I'm sure every parent says this about their kid, uh, but we have the, the coolest, <laughs> most chill. And maybe it's all the traveling she's done. Maybe uh, she's so adaptable. Um, she's uh, she's really kind. She's really calm. She's a real thinker. You know, she she looks at the world in a in a way. I just she's a daydreamer. You know, at sixteen months, I look at her looking at things. I'm like, what are you thinking about? What's your little six? What's your sixteen month old brain thinking about? <laughs> and uh, in the last eight? few months. She no, she she's not speaking so much. She's doing a lot of mama data, and mm -hmm. um, does a lot. But she's very communicative. She's really good at telling us exactly what she wants, without sort of knowing words. But it's amazing now because in the last six months, three months really, she has become obsessed with books, which I love. So she is just she can just point. She she gives a pile of her books. She gets her comfy blanket dumps the books next to me and we just, we, I'm so bored with them, but we just go through one by one. That's and nice. I speak in English and French when I'm, when I'm pointing at things, I say both words in French and English and she knows everything, you know, and it's just a thrill. It's a thrill to see that brain develop and that, and that, that personality come out and, and to sort of go, wow, that's very Alexia what she just did. I'm like, oh, wow, that's me. Uh, <laughs> and, and then there's things you're like, where did that come from? So it's pretty wonderful, mate. Oh, well, really, it's really cool. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Your pictures of her in Europe are stunning, and uh, I love seeing them. Yeah, it's cool. I look, you know, I mean, look, you know, social media is a bit of a, a weird thing, but for me, half the time is I'm not, I don't get on it that much, but I do post photos every night again because it's a lot of the time how family yeah. connect and then go, oh, God, she's growing, or oh, I miss her so much. I miss you guys. What's going? Oh, that's where you are. Like, we're like, you know, those books of Waldo. Half the time, I feel like, where's Waldo? They're like, where are you guys? Oh, okay, that's where you are. Because I saw it on Instagram. <laughs> uh, they but yeah, I mean, she's, 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 track. yeah, it's it's a it's a pretty cool thing in that way. I mean, look, I know there's a there's a lot of other troublesome things about social media that's not worth getting into, but uh, it's 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 good from my perspective. To every now and again, you know, we post something so people can, you know, go, ah, oh, that's what they're up to. I, I feel the same way. I mean, I think there are so much negative, but because I have a lot well, of Well, that's friends, how I keep in touch with you. you right. Know? Friends like, and family all funny. over we, the world. We haven't spoken in, you know, as I said, since since I left As The World Turns. But I feel like I haven't lost contact with you right. across, you know, like overall, because I'm like, ah, there he is without his shirt off in Fire Island again. <laughs> ah. <laughs> my my brother in law, if he was listening to this, would laugh his butt off because he always busts our chops about that. So. Ah, there he is! Oh, I'm like, wow, he's looking really fit. I gotta get back. I gotta get back into the gym. <laughs> so let's go back to Australia first. What were you like as a child? Like, were, were movies always, you know? Um, I'm looking uh, like creativity for you. Where did that? Well, I think I was a bit of a. I was a bit of a, you know, eclectic kid, I guess. Um, a bit undefinable, you know. I guess, you know, there's always the groups that you see in the, the 80s movies, particularly. There's the jocks and the, the geeks and the, the goths and, the, and the, the basket cases and whatever. I'm just thinking of Breakfast of the, on the um, Club. Breakfast Club. Yeah. I was probably a bit of all of them, to be honest. Um, you know, I was I was really into sport. You know, I played rugby, I played Australian rules football, I rode, I was a swimmer, I did a lot, and um and you know did really quite well. I was always into athletics. I wasn't I wasn't I was never you know I was always kind of up there. Um, but I also played music. I was also um, 
I, uh, I played saxophone for like 15 years when I was all through my schooling um, and guitar. And then I also was in the drama. <laughs> I did, you know, in the drama. Thing. I think like, you know, anything drama was mainly to hook up with um, the girls from the, the nearby school because, you know, that's what the only time that I went to an all boys school. So when we did the Romeo and Juliet, it was with the it was with their sister school. So it was more of a oh, she's cute. I, let me try out to this. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean movies. I was always into movies. It was like a, it was a bit of an obsession. Not my, I wasn't the guy that got out and you know you'll never hear me tell a story about getting the old Super 8 video and making movies right. in my backyard. I didn't do any of that. But um, I did. You know, I was I was. I did well at school. I mean, I, I, my grades were good for one reason, because my mum was cool. So I got my grades up really well. And I would say to mum, I don't want to go to school today. And she goes, all right. She'd look at my, all my paperwork. She'd see that I was all up to date. And she goes, what are you going to watch? I said, I don't know. I'm going to go down to... So when I was like 11, 12, all through my secondary school, I had the worst attendance record, but yet I got... My mum was cool because I got my grades never slipped. So she allowed me that day where I would just, everyone else would be at school, all my, my siblings, and I'd go up the road to the local, uh, you know, mum and pop video store, hire a couple of, you know, VHS tapes, go home, close all the blinds, and <laughs> have I a day to that. myself, have a day to myself watching movies, you know, scary movies, dramas, comedies, I kind of, I kind of did the gamut. So I guess that's where that kind of, you know, real obsession with with movies and storytelling and uh, kind of came from. Huh. And and you went to the National Institute of Dramatic Arts, right? And you studied yeah. there? Yeah. And economics, is that? <clears throat> so, yeah, when I left, again, well, you know, you're at secondary school, you don't know what you want to do. I mean, there are some people who won't know what they want to do. My older brother, he's a doctor, and then he became an anesthetist. And he was one of those rare cases. What is that? An anesthesiologist. Oh, okay. Okay. So, but he was one of those guys or rare, rare kids at, at secondary school where he knew what he wanted to do. He always wanted to be a doctor, even ever since he was, you know, I can remember. And again, you know, when I went through schooling, it's probably changed now, but when I went through, you, got, you did a certain amount of subjects in your secondary, in, in your final year. And depending on the, the marks you got. And again, the education system is very different in Australia because it's, it's basically free, but you had to get high grades to get into certain things. Excuse me. So if you wanted to study medicine or law or economics or account, you know, you had to get a certain high level of grade. So I got the grades that I wanted and I wasn't sure what I really wanted to do. So I, I got into economics law um, at Monash University, which is one of the big universities in Melbourne. I dropped out of the law part. Um, I'd finished the economics part just out of pure, uh, just let me get this done and not to disappoint my dad, really. <laughs> so I, I just, you know, I was like, oh, let me get this degree. And, and look, again, I, I had a pretty good memory. I was terrible at numbers. Even to this day, even my friends laugh at me. My wife laughs at me. She goes, you're so shit with money and, and figures. How were you ever an accountant? I'm like, I don't remember any of it. I would just like study for two days, pretty much memorize the book, regurgitate it, walk out of the exam, and I did not remember a thing afterwards. It was like just flushed out of my short-term memory. So I got a job at, a, at Price Waterhouse, which is one of the big firms at the time, and you know, got accepted into a really tough-to-get graduate program. And so I sat in a, I sat at this accounting firm as the worst graduate that they had. But I had a leg up on the other graduates because I knew a lot of people in um, the Melbourne nightlife, like who owned the really good bars and restaurants. So the partners needed to get into certain places to market and get, you know, the, the banks. I was in a, in a division that did a lot of insolvencies and receiverships and stuff like that. So they, they needed the bank's work. That's where the, a lot of the jobs came from. So they needed to take the bank, the bankers out to top restaurants. So I would get them reservations. I would get them into these. So I ended up just sitting at my cubicle, not even doing cash flows or anything. I was writing short stories. And yet 
everyone around me was doing all the hard work and I was just, you know, doing my own thing. And the partners would be like, uh, Paul, we need to. I was like, yeah, I'm on it. I'm on it. Yeah. So in the end, I stayed there for two years and <laughs> paid all this money basically to, to, be, to, to kind of work out their social calendar. And eventually I just went in one day and I went to their head partner and holding a piece of, of paper and he goes, is that what I think it is? And I'm like, yeah, I can't do this anymore. And they're like, thank God, get out of here. <laughs> you don't belong here. None of us had the heart to fire you. And, you know, and I was earning great money there. I kept getting promoted for some reason. Like, you know, you've, you've earned us a lot of money by getting us where we, but you just get out of here. This is not the life for you. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah they, they, they saw that in you, you know, they, they knew. Yeah. So, I, look, in, in the end, I, I wrote a couple of plays that I ended up doing um, for French festivals and acting in. And then uh, I was like, what am I going to do? And then, I, yeah, I, I tried out for the National Institute, which is one of the, you know, the biggest drama school. And I got in and then, uh, you know, then, then the real life passion kind of took hold. From there, but that's where Kate Blanchett, Mel Gibson, and your friend yeah. Worthington. Is that where you met yeah. Sam? Yeah, Sam, Sam and I, Sam Worthington and I, we, we were in the same year. So we went through, and look, it's, it's a, again, 20, about 15 plus thousand people Australia wide auditioned for 22 spots. So, you know, you feel pretty, and so it, it's an incredible facility. It's a great school. Some of, yeah, some of Hugo Weaving, uh, Jeffrey Rush, uh, Kate Blanchett, um, Judy Davis. It's a, it's a who's who of, of yeah, Australian I talent. When you were in New York, you, you telling me about the school. Cause I, I don't yeah. think I knew much about it before that. Yeah, and it's a tough school. I mean, you know, you don't, you can't really work um, because you know the the hours are so long. The discipline is really hard, um, but you know, you, you you learn a lot. And it's also a theatre school, so there's a design course, there's a directing course. So when you do do plays, um, every every semester you did a play, uh, and they're incredible productions. I mean, they're huge. They're as good as anything you'll see if not on Broadway, at least off Broadway. I'm not talking about talent, but in sort of production wise. Production wise. And, mm. You know, as I said in the introduction, I mean, actor, writer, director, I mean, when you graduated from that school, did you see one of those as your path or were you it all? Was, I, I, it was acting. I mean, I always wrote. I was always a writer and I did, um, even when I was at drama school and just left, <clears throat> I did write a couple of short films and a couple of plays and all that sort of stuff. Like, and I, I was always writing and sort of creating on that front. But like anyone, you know, you go through this drama school, you walk out and you're like, oh, I'm going to be the next Mel Gibson for sure. That's my path. At least as, on a professional front, not on a personal front. <laughs> uh, uh, so, you know. Sorry, took me a minute. I got it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, you know, you, you have those, you know, those, illusions of grandeur um and i look I, I i as soon as i graduated i i did a mini series which was a co-pro with america i i worked you know um and it was good it was great i mean and and some of the one of the best you know i i i never stood i've never stepped in on a theater stage since i left drama school because i hated theater i love watching it but i was terrible at it and you know i got the, the worst stage fright. I mean, I, I just, you know, I was about to always go on. Um, one of the plays that I did back in, back at drama school was Angels in America, which is an incredible, wow. an incredible piece of theater. And I played one of the lead roles. I played the guy, what was his name? Joe, was it? He was the Mormon, the, the Mormon. Um, and it was a big role. And I was, you know, I got pretty, you know, um, uh, but I, every single time before I went out on stage, even, how many times I'd done it. I'm in the behind the curtains, dry reaching. <laughs> oh, no. I'm like, Ugh. and the stage manager looking at me going, you all right? You need a bucket? I'm like, all right, I've got this, I've got this. And then I would, you know, go on and it would just all go after like 30 seconds. But I'm like, I can't do that. That's not for me. You prefer so, the camera. So I always knew that if I was going to make acting a, uh, you know, a thing. It was going to be in front of the camera. Plus, I didn't. 
projecting for the back wasn't for me. I was, you know, a bit too self-conscious about all that. So the, the sort of the minimalist of the of the, the camera and, the, and just sort of suited my style, I think, better. Anyway, but, you know, when I was got As the World Turns, I mean, that was, that was school for me. I mean, that was really, it is for anyone who goes on that show, I think, no matter, no matter how experienced you are. It's an incredible, you know, every day, every day is, is a, you know, you, you're learning 30 pages of material and then the next day it's, it's taped, then uh, it's gone. And the next, you know, you do, you do, you do it all over again. Were you in America when you got As the World Turns? No. No, I was in Australia. I was, about to, I was up for the lead of a really top new show in Australia. And um, I was, I was, it was out of me and someone else. And then my agent called me and said, there's this show that's come up. Um, it's, a, it's, in, it's in America. They shoot it in New York. I'm like, oh, what? That was all I heard. I was like, I didn't care what, I didn't care what else he said after that. And I, you know, I put, I put an audition down from, I was in Melbourne at the time or Sydney. I can't remember. Sydney, Sydney. So I put an audition down, sent it across to my agent. They sent it, didn't think anything more of it, had another call back for this other show. And then my agent called me and said, they want to fly you across for a call back for as the world turns. And I'm like, oh. They want to fly me to New York. I'm like, uh, I'm you know, I'm not long out of drama school. I'm still eating tuna on toast and and uh, and living off living off Vegemite. So I'm like, uh, that sounds pretty sweet. <laughs> fly me across. That's cool. Um, uh, and then then you know, I get my ticket and it's business class. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. How good is this? So I just decided to make the most of my one week in New York. And I didn't know. I didn't know there were going to be many other people flown across. Mm -hmm. So I got to, I was on the plane and I was like, ah, oh, I recognize that guy. Oh, that guy's a really good actor. I wonder what he's doing on this flight. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then I get to, get to New York and then, you know, I got in that car and I'm taken out to, you know, where we were, the JC studios. And, yeah. and, I, and, I'm, and I go in and I'm like, oh, this is all, it was cold. It was winter. I've never experienced that kind of, you know, cold before. And so I was like, oh, this is all new. And I was like, just, you know, treat it like it's the last time it's ever going to happen. I think that's what helped me. You know, I, I didn't, I wasn't there going, I have to get this job. I have to get this job. I was like, ah, just have fun. You know, this is a blast. And then all those dudes that were on those, that plane with me were, you know, it was that six others were in this audition. I think I'm sitting worst, shocked that we spent that much money flying everybody across the country from an, you know. Oh, from yeah. Oh, no. Mate, you had money on that show. Early 2000s, that show had some coin. I guess uh, so, because business class from Australia ain't cheap. <laughs> no, especially for six of us. Um, so I did the audition. I remember it was with Martha, and um, and uh, I, I was. it was such a bizarre experience because I never – I'd done a soap in in um, in uh, Australia. I did Home and Away, you know, which is a rite of passage for a lot of Australian actors. Um, uh, but you know, it's a single, it's a single, you know, maybe two camera. It's not a, it's not on a stage. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I've never done that four camera thing on a. And so it was all a bit weird for me. But I was like, oh, this is sort of like theatre. And then I realised, oh, you were really shit at theatre. Damn it! <laughs> so let's <laughs> just. Just have fun, just have fun. And um, Martha made that experience this other level. I mean, you know, I think we all know her well enough to, you know, there's, there's, there's not a word that can be said about her that isn't the kind, she's just the most genuine, incredible human being. And on that, on that day, she's just gone, yeah, you know, we got along. I was like, God, you, you've got a good sense of humor. Because I started out with a couple of really bad gags. And she laughed. She's like, all right, I think I like you because that's a pretty shit gag, but I get where you're coming from. Uh, and so we, we, you know, we did the audition and it was, you know, on the four cameras and, and the, the executive producer was Chris, Chris Goutman. Mm -hmm. And I could hear his voice like God speaking from somewhere. I was like, where's his voice coming from? Like giving me direction. Why did, that's not very intimate. Come and talk to my face. Um, 
so then, you know, I'm there auditioning with Martha and I had a thing where I had to walk across the floor and give her a glass of champagne and be very charming. And I think, uh, no, I didn't. I, I tripped on the carpet and I spilt the champagne on down her front. But I think what helped is I didn't break character. I kind of acted like that was part of the scene and I meant it. And I did something kind of with her dress and she was like, oh, this is. And so I think through that back and forth of sort of a bad mistake, it, it kind of helped, I think. So anyway, we, you know, we were still in New York. I was in, I ended up befriending these other, these other actors and we all hung out for five days in New York and we got on a plane. We all went back to Australia. No one knew, no one was told that they had the job. So we all thought we blew it. Uh, and then, you know, about a few days, I, like, I barely landed. And then, uh, and then, uh, I got the call from my agent saying, you got the job. I was like, oh, that's cool. So when do I start? Like six months, I've got a few things to do before then. I'm like, no, no, you're going to be there in two weeks. So, uh, yeah, turn, turning your, turning your life upside down and, and changing your life and selling everything, breaking up with girlfriend, uh, saying goodbye to family, doing all those things that you have to do. That normally takes time. I had to do it in like, you know, 10 days. <laughs> so it was, it was, it was intense. Even even it's actually you know, nice to it's it's actually nice to 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 reminisce about it's like it's like it's been so long since I thought about it. It's so interesting because you talk about the fast pace of just doing a show, but it's also fast paced in that process of casting. There are people who sometimes, you know, a Friday fly in from Los Angeles and then they find out they have to be there in three days. You have to <clears> well, I think yeah. Well, I think it's like anything on those shows. Um, they they have an idea for storyline and character and they need to move fast. Um, so they happen to really want an Australian character and they weren't finding whoever they wanted locally. So they, they had to move fast and, you know, they had to, they got my visa. They did all those things super quick. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, two weeks, two weeks after getting the job, I think I was, I was in, in New York. I still remember that moment of kind of going across the, or whatever it must have been one of the, one of the bridges of Williamsburg or one of those bridges. Yeah. With my, with my life in two suitcases and it was night and it was snowing and looking at the the lights of New York and, you know, the twin towers were still around then and, and just going, wow, I'm a, <laughs> this is this is this is where I'm going to be and. It was exciting and daunting. At the Had you been to New York prior to this? No. Wow. Only, only in my memory, only in my imagination. Yeah. Um, and, uh, n nothing, nothing of your imagination can live up to actually being and living in New York. <laughs> wow. What? So what? Yeah. I, I want to stick on world turns, but let's. What was New York like for you? New York was amazing. I mean, luckily for me, <clears throat> there was quite a few Australians I knew when I got there. Um, so I kind of had an instant kind of little friendship group. Um, uh, not long after being there, um, one of my really good mates moved from Hong Kong to, to New York. Then another really good buddy moved from Melbourne. So I had a kind of an instant posse of like, like not just friends, like best friends within about six months of being there. And then on top of that, I also had the incredible welcoming of, of the cast and crew of, of As the World Turns. And I got to work with Martha every day and Terry. And those those two became, you know, fast, thick as thieves friends. <laughs> so um, it was it was home, you know. I always said moving from Sydney to, to New York took me about two weeks to settle in. And I'm like, ah, oh, I found my place. And when I moved from New York to LA, for, not for once I left As The World Turns, I got another acting gig to move to LA. It took me about two years to settle into LA. And that was within the same country. So it was, uh, it was uh, New York was an incredible experience. It was, it was absolutely a remarkable time. It was, uh, you know, um, I was working, I was, I was having fun on the show, I was, living the life with my friends in, you know, in New York at, 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 a, at an amazing time in the city. I saw some horrors, you know, I lived through 
sort of the whole 9-11 experience and and I, I went through all these changes and got to see New York sort of rally and bounce back and mm-hmm. you know I got to I got to really see the hearts and souls of not only New Yorkers but Americans and, and what they really are made of and, and and that it was it was really an incredible time really amazing time I, I loved it I loved it and I haven't been back I mean I've I have been back I've visited but I haven't been back to live again and um you know it's it's got a really 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 special place in my heart you know, that's for sure that's awesome do you remember mm. your first day in oakdale no for- <laughs> <laughs> i probably was i was probably so anxious that just sort of blacked out and, and it's out of my brain <laughs> i'm sure i was wearing some dodgy turtleneck and uh, <laughs> you know it's it's one of those things where you find your groove in your character and um after after a bit because you know it, it's it's the, the costume people have an idea about what they want other people have an idea i'm like oh i don't like that but i'm so new i can't say i don't feel comfortable in that just yet so you know once once you sort of found your groove mm. it was yeah. um but it, but again i found I, I found my groove quite quickly maybe not maybe not in performance but at least in in you know, settling into the group because the crew were awesome and the and the the uh, the cast was so great and welcome. It was it really was. It's it's a bit cliche, but it really was a bit of a family. You know, it was everyone there. There was there was not there was no rivalries. There were no egos. Everyone was really just in it to to do the best show possible and and have a good time doing it, which was really cool. Do you have a favorite story? Um, you know, again, it's, it's been a while. So I feel like, well, some fans were asking, you know, they know like, uh, Simon and Katie were so incredibly popular, but one of our fans, um, was saying that, uh, Noelle was saying to me that, uh, you're her favorite, uh, actor on As The World Turns and I'll be- Thanks Noelle. Thanks Noelle. You're the best. Obviously everyone, uh, loved the pairing of Simon and Katie. Katie, but she was wondering about the beginning story because she loved you with Lily, you know, the bickering, the stranded on the island, the love story, the the friendship, yeah, after I mean, the, break, the uh, breakup. Yeah, look, all that stuff was really fun. I mean, all that, that, that was ridiculous, you know, all that stuff stuck on the island. And you, you walk into the studio and you're like, oh my God, uh, Martha and I sand. would look at that <laughs> with that, pi- that pile of sand and those stupid <laughs> fake trees. And we're like, oh. Okay, but you get on set and you're like, ah, this is fun. It's just playtime, you know. It's it's playtime. Like, oh, today I'm going to step on a landmine, you know, and and the dirt's going to blow up, and you know, it's going to be. It was it was fun. It was like, um, and all that stuff with Martha. Again, I was really, you know, I was really lucky that obviously in soaps you're often paired with a with a uh, uh, another uh, with a woman and. I was so lucky that my three pairings were Martha, Terry, and Ma- and Maura. I just, it was just, they were not only really incredible actors, but amazing people, and three people with incredible senses of humour that I really needed, because that's how I kind of work. I, I would, that's what I was saying about this, this show being school. I love that you could just try new things. Like in a scene, I didn't sometimes didn't know what I was going to do. And I would do things that sometimes would work really well. That would be like, would throw my partners off. And then that's when the sparks fly. And that's when the scene's really alive. Because you do something that is a bit, uh, you know, unexpected. And there are other times I did stuff that definitely didn't work. And you're like, oh, God, thank God that that tomorrow is a new show and no one will think about that again. (laughs) But you're so but right was, about their senses of humor. They do all three. It was, it was, it and was so awesome. different too. Yeah, and look, the you know the that uh, Hogan was the the head writer, and it was a great period for me because he really loved my character, and he was, he took a lot of care with it, and he just allowed me to do what I wanted in some ways. Um, in as much as they would write the scenes, and I'd be like, ah, I don't know. And then, so I, you know, they gave me a fairly, and even even Chris 
yeah, they gave me a fairly free reign to. They were like, oh, he's Australian. He maybe we're not writing it properly from Australian. I was like, oh, well, you're doing a pretty good job, but I just want to change it. So you know, I, I wrote a lot of different things, but I would always my feed line to the actors was always the same, and they would be like, oh, they would. I would walk in, they'd see my scripts, and they'd be like, oh, whatever, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> they, would, they would get to the point where they were like, as long as the story's being told, we don't care how you tell it. Just make sure the line to the actor is, is something that they can understand. Or, you know, you're not changing their thing. So they um, were really, my, they, those guys were really open to it. And, and, and again, because they didn't know what I was going to do, it kind of kept the scene alive and a lot of fun. And I would... I, I would do things with the crew too, because I was I just needed little challenges. You know, you do that show every day. You know, you want to keep challenging yourself and and do silly stuff. And one day I remember doing a scene where I was at a bar, you know, and you're going in and it was a scene, I think it was with Hunt Block maybe. But anyway, it was a scene where I had to go to a bar and have a beer. And um, uh, there was the, the props people put, a bowl of goldfish, you know, those little goldfish. Yeah, yeah, I love them. Yeah, yeah. So they would put them, you know, like as a prop on the bar as a snack. And I would, I would always have these things with the prop guys, and I'd be like, I'd say to them, I bet I can eat that entire bowl of goldfish by the end of this scene. And they're like, that's it's impossible. The scene's only a, like a page long, a page. You know, those scenes are normally soap scenes are normally like you know, the Bible, they're so long. But this uh, this one was a short one. It was only like a page and a half, and this is a pile of goldfish. They're like, you're never going to get through that. So I was like, all right. So I had a bet, and uh, it was like $500 on the line. <laughs> Go so, I'm, so I'm there at the bar, and then, you know, the scene starts, and I'm talking, and I'm like sipping the beer. And I'm, Do you know you know, who was in the scene? What's that? Do you remember who was in the scene? I, it was a scene that I think it was that storyline that was either with you remember he's a great actor and a great guy Richie Costa. He yeah, went on yeah, to have a career. Richie, yeah, yeah. He went on to have a. He's got a. He's got oh, an amazing he is, career. He's amazing. So, he he was married to one of the Guiding Light producers. Right. So Richie um, had and he, a storyline. He was on Guiding Light with in a story with Tom Pelfrey, I believe. Right. Yeah. So I think it was a scene with Richie from memory. I think. Um, cause I, I, he and I like played up a little bit. So I think it was him anyway. So we're at the scene having a beer and like, it was one of those, uh, you know, mano a mano scenes and I'm popping goldfish and I could see out of the corner of my eye, the props people looking at me going, oh, they were smiling from ear to ear cause the scene's almost done. And I've only had about four goldfish. <laughs> and so at the end, I think it was like to seal a deal. And so Richie looks at me, you know, like, the, or let's say it was Richie, maybe it was someone else, but let's, you know. The actor was like, so cheers. And I was like, and he held up his beer and I went to hold up my beer. And I was like, and I picked up the bowl of goldfish and I went cheers. And I threw I back it. the entire bowl of goldfish. And I was like, and, you know, and then I walked out and I was like, oh, and all the props guys like, what the fuck? <laughs> and, then, and then I was like, I was standing off, off stage. I was like, wait for it, wait for it. And then you hear, and that's a take. Moving on, I was like, yes, five hundred dollars. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, so I was like, fun stuff like that. I like, I love the show because you could, you could, you, you know, I, I could get away with those sort of things, but you know, with it within the character because the character was a bit, you know, loose. Right, and Simon was that kind of character. So if you yeah. were to describe each of those ladies, Martha, Terry, Mora, like a word or two. Wow. Um, that's putting putting me on the spot. I mean, look, I yeah, I, and I, I make a living from my words, and yeah, I know really, it should be. Uh, well, look, yeah, I mean, look, Martha is look, again. I mean, I, I, it's hard to sum them up in one word because they're just, I, you know, Martha was just so kind, uh, and just cool, and just took me under her wing. You know, she was a she was a veteran, and I was this newbie, and just from the very beginning, she's uh she's just like. Just you're with me. Let's you know we're gonna we're gonna have a blast doing this, and we did, on screen and off screen. I went to her place in in Jersey Shores, and I hung with her family as I did with all these with all the cats. But you know, I really became part of her family, and and uh, she just so you know really took care of me. And she's she we still obviously are still in touch, and I'm sure one day we'll we'll work on something together. She's doing a lot more producing stuff now, and 
she's got a great eye. She's super talented. And, um, you know, Terry, Terry, I haven't seen for quite a while, but not just because of life. But, but again, Terry and I had a, she was just, you know, she was just so fun to work with because of that relationship that, that the characters had was kind of like the relationship that she and I had off, off stage, which was just friends, pure, pure friendship. Um, that we were like, you know, like again, like brother and sister, we were just, but you know, we were able to do that flirtatious thing without having anything underneath it. Um, and I think that easy chemistry that we had off screen kind of played on screen. And there was, there was no, um, there was no censorship with, with our, with what we could do with each other in, in a scene. You know, she was, she would let me fly and I would let her and we would just sort of, buzz around each other and let the other person you know play play their thing and the other knowing that the other person it was going to land and we would accept that you know um but you know terry's just the most adorable you know sweet human being in the world and um you know more is just a she's a she's a, a firecracker she's a she's just a, a an incredible aura of energy this you know like uh, working with her too was uh, all three with with such incredible amazing women but all such unique different energies and with more I felt like I had to be more grown up you know I felt like I had to <laughs> I felt like you know because she had that relationship with Michael and Michael and I got along amazing off screen but I loved as my character was giving shit to Michael like to Jack on screen I really liked needling him on well, camera some people like, giving like to Michael too <laughs> I could I could see it really getting under Jack's skin. Uh, so, you know, and knowing that they were that kind of whatever superpower couple, whatever they, the soap people call it, I kind of just, it made me feel a bit more grown up becoming, you know, a little thing of, so, you know, I remember, I remember doing a scene with Maura where we had to do, we were away in uh, some island as, the, as you are, you know, you're in the studios, but you're in Cuba, you know, um, and we were drinking Mai Tais and getting drunk and we did some flamenco dance and all this. And I was like, oh, God, I, this is the first time I really, this is, this feels like we're, uh, we're in a Bond movie. This is really cool. It was like, you know, with, with more, it always felt like we were doing something, uh, kind of grandiose. <laughs> it was, uh, that didn't just that didn't answer your question. I didn't describe those ladies, but they were all brilliant. And no, that's great. Right. And, and they're, and they're wonderful people. They really are. And one of our fans, Laura, just said, I love the antics of Simon and Henry. And Stephen Berman just texted this. Oh, that's hysterical. Oh, wow. Look at my, that's, a, that's quite a pout I'm doing. He thinks it's, I think, the first picture he took of you. <laughs> well, that's quite a, that's quite a jacket. Um, um, talk talk he, about he, Trent, the, Like Trent was, Trent was, a, uh, Trent again is like another level talent, you know, like, that guy, I mean, he. St I think he started just before me. Um, but you know, there's never been an actor that embraced a character more, and and grew into it, but molded it and shaped it and allowed that character to 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 dictate terms in a lot of ways. Like as because of how good he was as that character and how conniving and manipulative and loving and he was really good. And it's an actor thing. He was really good at Henry playing lower status, but always maintaining upper status. It's it's a really unique thing that that Trent did, and I and and hats off to. He's such a, he he's so talented, not only you know comedically, but also in the drama stuff. But his his performance com always as that character was so committed, and I loved our scenes together. I love that because I think we both had the same sense of play that that um that you know it was like okay game on like when when we when we were in the scene together it was like all right you can't let your guard down you can't be lazy you can't just learn your lines and turn up you've got to be present and in the scene and you've got to be really alive because otherwise you know he'll get it over you and i and it was like that it was like that great kind of bit of you know camaraderie competition between the two of us that I think allowed those characters to really have a have a fun dueling, um, uh, you know, relationship. 
Well, Hogan knew what he had in both of you that, you know, and so he, he wrote for both of you so well. Um, yeah. Sure. Also asked what, what was it like the, the great scenes with Elizabeth Hubbard where Simon was drunk and you drove the car through the house. Oh uh, yeah. You ended up planting a kiss on Lucinda in front of Lily and Katie. Remember that's when, that's when as the world turned had money. I got to do some really good shit on that show. I drove the I car. The house. That, stunt. that was a really br big stunt with the car. I got to, I got to jump out of a plane. I got to get blown up on an Island. I got to fight myself on a, on a boat in a, in a tornado or a hurricane. Um, remember I played that second character yeah. that, that was so random. Um, <laughs> but, um, Elizabeth Hubbard, I mean, look, you know, the grand dame, like she's like, you know, she's like, she was like the, uh, the Judy Dench or the, or the, or the Maggie Smith of As the World Turns, you know, as you're, when you, when you're acting with her, you're like, you're going to leave, you're going to leave any, uh, any sense of, of, of amateur hour at the door. Uh, she, she was, you know, she's brilliant. She's just, you know, she was, she, again, for someone who had been on that show so many years, Every scene that she's in, she's alive. Yeah. You know, she's on. She's not taking anything for granted. She's not phoning it in. She's not, and that's not. It, this is not to say anyone I worked with did that. I mean, that was that was the joy of for me going to work on As the World Turns. Everyone was just so committed and alive, and and uh, it took it. You know, it wasn't a paycheck for anyone. Um, but yeah, she was great, and I loved that. That was that was actually one of my favorite scenes of like. You know, because again, Liz. You know, I would say to I would say to I would say to her beforehand. You know, I kind of don't want to tell you what I'm going to do, and she goes, "Don't, don't do whatever you want. Just surprise me, Paul. Surprise me." I was like, "All right, I'll surprise you." <laughs> when, she, when she gives you that's a gift, right there, you, from her. Huh? That's a gift right there from Elizabeth Hubbard. Like, just yeah. go. And I don't think even that's that kiss was scripted. I don't even think that was scripted. I think that was something that we just, just did. <laughs> it was pretty funny. Yeah, I mean, it was great. And they did spend money. I mean, I remember that. Donovan Curry was that other character, which was so, so you know, with, with your same face. Uh, what is, that was so random. I mean, like when I tried to explain to friends, um, <laughs> like, what like you so wait, 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 <laughs> so wait. You you went to you, you're playing two characters on the shot, mate. Right? You know, cause, you know, you go out, you have beers with your buddies, and you're like, oh, how was how was work for you, Paul? I'm like, oh, I had to fight myself. I'm like, what what? They're like, so wait, this other character is your twin. <laughs> it's your evil twin. I'm like, mm, no, but he is evil. He is evil, but he's not your twin. No, <laughs> he was. He grew up being obsessed with Simon Fraser. So he got plastic surgery to look like him. They're like, that doesn't make sense. I'm like, no, no. <laughs> but I'm like, but they believe but, you it. Know, they believe it. It was a lot. It was a lot of fun to play that character too. Because again, if if Simon was, if Simon could be a bit of a loose unit, Donovan Curry, I could just take to eleven. You know. Mm. Oh right, because he right he wanted to be you basically. Yeah, and he was just nuts. Like he was a bit of a you know. So I could I was allowed to smoke and like. Where you know, just be real. You know, my my Australian accent got way thicker. Um, so yeah, that was a that was a that was fun. It was a fun summer. It was a fun ride you had there. Um, yeah, it was it, great. Kim asked, "What um, what's the best life or professional lesson you think you took away from working in Oakdale?" Uh, I I just think not take anything for granted. I mean, you know those. Um, those uh, are, you know, act, if you if you work as an actor, you're already in the one percent. If you work as a writer, you're in the same. You know, you. It's so many people want to do this job, and so many people are brilliant at it, and still don't get to do it in a professional capacity for whatever reason. Um. So I think when I got that job and I left drama school and across that city and, you know, across that bridge into New York. And I think from that day, I was like, this is, I, this is my life. I, I kind of, I guess I, I chose to go to drama school. I guess I, you know, I chose to, um, to, to do all that because I, I wasn't, I didn't want to be an accountant. But then as soon as I started doing on As The World Turns, I was like, this is what I do. 
wow, I'm getting paid to do this. I mean, I'm getting paid to, you know, roll around and take my shirt off and kiss these amazing looking women. Oh, wow. Don't even though it's fun, don't take it for granted. I mean, there's a, it's a, it's a privileged position to be in. And, and I think from then I really, I, it's acting is a, it's a job and it's a profession and it's, um, it's something you need to continually and um, writing and directing as well. You need to constantly work at it. You can't just think it's just going to keep happening because it can't, it doesn't, you know, if you stop working at it, it'll, it'll go away. So I think, I think that I guess was my lesson was just, you know, never take it for granted and always just keep working. Hmm. Um, I hope you're not in a rush because I've got questions and we have to talk about the movie, but I'm curious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you said um, you were writing early, you know, at, when you were doing the accounting stuff, like how early were you writing and, and where, I mean, because I, you, you, you know, I have the list of everything you're working on and everything you're doing. I mean, your your creativity is boundless. It's, it's you you know, the things you've done since Leaving World Turns and the things that you've, you, you've written you know, truly astounded me. Like that's a lot coming out of one man's head. Yeah, um, look, it's it, 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 it's like what I was just saying. It's there's no free passes in this in in what in this game. And I guess when I when I left um when I left as the world turns, I did I did a a show called <laughs> LAX, which lasted for thirteen episodes. And um, I was that following pilot season, I was up for. I think I studio and network tested. So when you're up for new pilots, um, you do a, you do an audition, you go to the producers, you work with the director, and if they if then they they may not, they they get it down to two people, they get it down to two actors that they want to present to the network and the studio, and mm -hmm. generally one of those actors is chosen for the for the role. You know, in the the, the new. CBS series or new, you know, whatever. So one, you know, one pilot season, I, I, I network and studio tested for seven pilots. I got one of them and that didn't go forward. Um, and I didn't get the others. And I ended up losing two phones at ABC when I was studio testing out at Disney because I just get so frustrated at the process and I'd come down and I'd just throw my phone against the wall <laughs> and I'm like, oh shit, there's another Apple four or whatever it was at the time. <laughs> Uh, and then, and then my agent, I'd get home, and then my agent, I still had a home phone, I guess. My agent would call me and go, "Where have you been? I've been trying to get you." I said, "Oh yeah, I think I blew that audition and I threw my phone." And the, they're like, "Can you stop doing that? We've been <laughs> trying to call you because they wanted you to go back up. They really liked you." And I'm like, "Ah, shit." <laughs> so I was like, I was like, I think I need a bit of a break from acting for a, for a beat. You know, I just. I get fr I was getting a bit frustrated by being a bit pigeonholed. I was a bit stereotyped, uh, typecast in a way. I was all going up for all the lead roles and stuff, but at the same time, I was like, I feel like I'm a little bit different to that. You know, I feel like my groove is is outside of that. You know, detective who's always quite stoic and turns up and finds the dead body and and talks about who could have murdered. I just I felt like I just needed something a little bit more stimulating. So I guess long story, long way to get around to. I always wrote, and I and I wrote a movie. I had my a good buddy of mine. He had just won Project Green Live Australia, which was the. You know, remember that HBO yeah. show? Yeah. 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 So was he, that he, Matt did, Damon and Ben Affleck? Yeah, they yeah. did. So they did one in Australia. They did, uh, and so my buddy won it, and he directed the winning film. And he came to America, and he was living with me. Um, and I just pitched this idea. He was also always a very good, he was an actor. We went through drama school together, um, but also was always a really great writer and a director. So I pitched him this idea and it was quite dark and we were like, all right, let's, so we sat down and we wrote it and it ended up selling to, um, to it was around the same time actually that I went and did that stint on As The World Turns, that, um, that second stint. I was in New York when I when I learned that um, uh, that it was actually quite a fun story. I was in New York. I was at home. My agent called me, my writing agent, and he's like, "Are you near a television?" And they're like, well, "I'm like, yeah." He goes, "Turn on, turn on the Lakers game." So I said, "I'm like, all right." I'm like, "Why?" He goes, "The lawyers are negotiating with Joel Silver right now." 
So Joel Silver, like, was he was he was down in the front, apparently, and he was like, I was like, what? So, <laughs> and so anyway, which which project was this? Uh, that ended up being um, the factory, the yeah. the dark psychological thriller with with John Cusack and Jennifer Carpenter, yeah. and, and so that, you know from uh, uh, Vampire Diaries, and uh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. I just watched the trailer. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna watch it. I, it's on Amazon Prime. It looks great. Yeah, I mean, look, it's it's. I think it's good. I mean, look again. I you know, it's not. Uh, it's a movie I wouldn't make today. You know, it's not. You, that's the thing about writing. Your your sensibilities change. Your, you know, what you think will sell will change. You've kind of got to always be. You've got to be apprised of the market and go. Okay, if I work on this, it's going to take quite a lot of time. I've got to know by the time I write it, I rewrite it, I rewrite it, I rewrite it, I rewrite it, I get it to my agent, I sell it, or I set it up somewhere. That's a process. You've got to understand that then when that happens, that that idea is not yesterday's news, you know, or not relevant or current anymore, which is a bit of a juggling act and a bit of it, because you've got to be passionate about the idea to spend that amount of time in a room working on a piece of material. But you've also got to be aware that, you know, it's not going to date. Um, so with with the factory, I mean, it was it came out at a time when, you know, those psychological thrillers, horrors were doing really well, and um, um, yeah, I, that's why it sold quite quickly. And no, it's not, it's never been as easy as that. You know, first script, you know, studio film, a list actor. You know, it's it's it's, it's not that easy. But uh, it, it was a great. So that was, that was, was the it was because I was going to ask after World Turns. That was like that was the first, yeah. And and what? How did you feel when that sold? Oh, it was amazing. It was like ah, wow. It was almost like well, that was easy. And then you're like, well, no, it wasn't easy. Um, actually, Morgan Morgan came to to New York, and uh, it was around Thanksgiving, and um, uh, Martha actually said. I know you're working on your script. Uh, if you want the house in, in LBI, you should oh. you can take. So it was awesome. Part of part of the final draft of the factory that sold was written at Martha's Beach House, um, and she had a cop living across the street. So he was awesome because he would we would be like, God, does this sound right that a cop would say this? Or so he'd just come across and he'd have a beer with us and we'd talk about the script. And he was an amazing consultant. So. Um, but yeah, it, it wasn't that easy. I've, I've set up a lot of material and sold quite a lot of material since then, but none of it's been as easy as that. That was just, you know, light, that was lightning in a bottle, you know. Because I, I'm looking at all the things you have done and written and the things that you have in the works, where do the, you know, are you looking at the news? Are you reading books? Like, where's all that coming from? In your um, a lot of it's from, you know, read, yeah, reading the news. Uh, yeah, the news, a lot of books. I mean, I'm a vora pretty voracious reader. Um, uh, a movie I've got set up to do next year is based on a book that, that I optioned. Um, a movie I did with Sam, actually, um, Hunter's Prayer. That was based on a book I found and I got Sam attached to that and then, then we got that made. Um, that looks Other good. Things, it's also on Amazon Prime. Yeah, I watched and, all the trailers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Hunter's Prayer in the end didn't turn out to be the project. It's again, you know, it's you, you cut your teeth on these things. That was that was something. You know, I got Sam attached. I wrote the script. We had Philip Noyce attached to direct. Then he he had to leave because he was doing another um, movie, so he couldn't stay on. Then another director came on, and that director brought on. Um, mm as directors do, bring on a couple of writers. I mean, I'm a writer-director, so when I chick fight, I, I came on and I, I rewrote, you know, what I wanted to, to, you know, to, to get the level of cast on that. But, you know, this director got someone else to rewrite and it just didn't end up being the movie that I wanted to make or, or I didn't think. But, you know, that happens. Um, and, you know, all these other stuff and these other ideas from reading, from... From stuff I've seen, um, from from experiences, um, and just from you know pure warped imagination sometimes. Yeah, I mean, that, I mean, uh, your your short film with Malin Ackerman, who's also in Chick Fight, was that is that from something? 
that story. That was I, also, yeah. That was it's also it, stars it, Paolo Saganti and is yeah, on YouTube yeah. for folks. Bye bye Sally. I actually put the link on YouTube for folks if they want to see it. So uh, yeah, that was that was that was one of the that was so long that was done back in two thousand and seven. I want to say so it's quite old. It's it's quite um, you know again it was done we shot it in a couple of days and it was done for a price and but look again it's, it was a it was a good experience it was good it was good to to actually martha helped produce that which was great um it was uh it was based on a short story by lisa minetti who is a fantastic author and a new york upstate writer who's become subsequently a friend of mine i've optioned another short story of hers that i've got set up uh, that hopefully will go in the next year or so um and it's uh it was fun. It was a really twisted little, you know, yeah, it was it was a twisted little story about what if you turned suicidal people into reluctant hit hit people. Um, and uh, da Damien Grimaldi, Paolo Saganti was fantastic. Paolo was great. I mean, I because I, Paolo was out there, and I I thought I want someone who's again quite suave, a bit of an accent, and I was like, oh, Paolo, you know, we had. So I called him up and he loved it. He had a ball and he and Martha would, uh, Mar Marlon were terrific in the scene together. So yeah, that was fun. But yeah, some of the other, some of the other material, it's just like, you know, a lot of it's not even announced because, you know, it's stuff is set up with, I've got TV stuff set up with studios and other um, big production places and actors and you, you don't really announce it or you can't really speak about it until, you know, it's, mm -hmm. You know, it's stages of development. You know, they they enter. There's nothing really happens overnight. Well, before we go to chick fight, so how, like, what is writing like for you? Like, are you doing it hours? Like, like I, what is your it, process? It's a job. It's a job. I mean, I treat it like a. I'm I'm pretty disciplined in as much as it's um I I'm you know it 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 bugs my French wife to no end that I'm <laughs> such a person of routine. Because the French are a little bit more laissez-faire, you know. So they, you know, they. She's like, oh, she doesn't. She's not. She doesn't like to plan too much. And I'm like, I'm up. I'm this. I've got to have my coffee at this time. I have my breakfast. <laughs> like, I, you know, I've got to. You know, I start that, my day that's my, my husband, but I'm uh, I'm pretty much up early, and I'll I'll do my work uh, and coffee. But outside, planning outside of thing. outside of work stuff, I don't like planning either. But when it comes to my work, I. It's one of those things, which is why I think I've done quite well, and I'm, you know, I'm I'm, I'm sort of entering another really good stage of my career. I think it's because I think that discipline is. If you stop, it's hard to just keep. You know, you you go, oh, oh, I can just take a day off. I'm not. This is a new piece of material I'm writing. No one's paying me to write it. I can just take a day off. It's like that's when. It's when you're not getting paid, when you're writing something on spec, you've got to be even more disciplined because what is writing on that is you're putting so much time into it and free time that you want that to sell. You want that to get picked up somewhere because you want all those hours to pay off. So I think for me, my writing is, is, is quite disciplined. You know, I'm, I'm in France and in Belgium at the moment, but I'm in Europe. So I get up and I, and I, I take care of my, my child and because Alexia is on set. And then I hand when she, after her first nap, I hand her over to the, to our nanny and I go to work. I read, I read all up about how uh, America is burning and on fire. And so I catch up with my home, with my, with my last country. Cause I've still got a big foot placed in there. So, uh, and then I, I, I and read the trades and I see what you're in Europe. You're What's that? Every and you're very thankful that you're in Europe. Yeah, starting to get that way. I'm not going to lie. Uh, <laughs> so no. it's um, and then you know I go to work. I write. I write, and I have a certain amount of hours. I write. I have lunch. I try and do some kind of workout, even if it's you know something limited, just to get do some exercise because you can you can get quite sedentary um, as a writer. Um, and uh, you know I, I end at a certain time, and I that's that's when I finish. So. It's it, it's a job. It's a job I love, and that makes it easy, you know. Well, I get I, I I never get bored. I love it. I love what I do. Well, you know, just looking at all the things, I could tell that. Where did you hone your directing? You know, like what was the first? 
Was it? Um, I did a few things when I was back in Australia, but I was very limited. Um, I know, and look again. I think it's just from from working as an actor. Um, I think as an actor, I've learned to 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 work with directors that I like and I don't like. There are some directors who are really visual, who know how to move a camera and they know how to set up a shot, but they do not know how to talk to actors and they don't know how to communicate what they are not liking or liking in a scene, which is frustrating from an actor. All actors need, actors are simple beings. We need validation and we need to know that we're on the right. We've got our own thoughts about a scene and that's often what we do in the first few takes. Um, but, you know, a director is, is a sculptor. You know, we're, we're the clay. So the director's got to come in and go, oh, I'm really liking this, don't you know? But here, just, we're, we're, you know, let's mold this a little bit here to bring out that emotion or to bring out, you know, something else. So I love those directors, not the directors who come in and talk to you for half an hour and you still don't know what they want. <laughs> but those directors that but those directors that come in and give you a line, it's sometimes a word and you're like, ah, tweak, it changes everything. And I think being an actor has really helped me as a director. Um and again, loving movies and and being a being a bit of a film nerd um has really helped me understand what what I like and, and you know, how to move a camera. But you know, I mean I'm still I'm still at that level, chick fight is a not a big budget movie and so you're still under the constraints of budget i'm not i'm not i don't have all the tools that david finch is working with i've got limited tools i've got very limited time i've got limited money um so you've really got to know what you want you've got to really know how you're going to edit the movie in your head before you shoot it because you know again someone like a fincher has the luxury of shooting so much coverage and then working a lot of things out not saying he's not planned but i you know on the stuff that i've done i haven't quite had that luxury you've got to really know what you want how you want to do it how you know that the it'll make the actors comfortable because the actors are going to come to you with with an idea of how they want to do it and i, I just didn't have the time on chick fight to sit for two hours and and you know, convince the actors that it was my way. I had to know what they were going to say to me um, so I could already pre-plan around what they were thinking. Um, and I think that only helps because I was an actor and um, and I love working with actors. I love actors. I love, I respect what they do because I know how tough it can be. Right. Um, it's just so, and I love directing. I just, it's my, it's my happy place, you know, apart from being with my wife and my kid, being on a, being on a set, um, with the pressures and the stress and the strain, it's military. You're the general, you know, and knowing that you've got producers looking at you, knowing that the th the time is ticking by, you've got to get this scene and you've got stunts to do and all that. That's what I'm like, ah, I like this. I thrive off this sort of controlled chaos. I like it. Is that your favorite then? Look, I love writing because I, I, I you know, I, I, yeah, I, I mean, I love both. I, I love I love writing because I get to. Uh, there's nothing more pure uh, form of expression, I think, in creativity. I mean, you're literally whatever your whatever line you're thinking is coming out on the page, whatever scene you're thinking is coming out, whatever whatever thought process, whatever whatever um, you know emotional relationship is between two characters is all coming from you it gets fine tuned by the director, it gets honed, and then it gets honed again by the editor. But it comes out of the writer's brain originally. So, I mean, I love that. I love that canvas, you know? I'm not scared of a blank page. I actually get exhilarated by, by, by a blank page. I think this is, this is exciting, you know? That write, writing that first, you know, slug line of a script, it's like, it's tough, but you're like, all right, here we go. It's an exciting, it's an exciting journey that you take yourself on, you know. But directing is directing for me is, I, I love that. I love the adrenaline, you know. I love the chick fight was it was a great. I, I got to work with incredible actors. I got to work with amazing stunt people, and in a in a in a in a place that is is not easy to shoot, 
in Puerto Rico. And it's, it was, um, I just love the adrenaline. It's, you get up every day and you're like, all right, we're going to war. If I make this day, you just, every day you're moving the front line forward one and you can't, you can't move, you can't go backwards. If you lose a scene, you're screwed. So you know every day you've got a page count, you've got your scenes you need to hit, and, uh, you know, by hook or by crook, you've got to get them. So there's nothing better than calling cut with one minute, sometimes 30 seconds to go, because we didn't have the money to go into overtime, and then going, wow, I made that day. You go and have a drink with a few of the cast, you kind of celebrate the victory, then you get up in the morning, <laughs> you do it all again. So yeah. it's cool. So talk, tell us about the movie, Chick Fight. Uh, the, mov the movie is, um, so the movie came to me and my producer, Anne Clements, who I've worked with right back. She produced that short film I did back in long, you know, 12 years ago, 12, 13 years ago. So I've had a long relationship with Anne. She produced the two seasons of the TV show I did with Sony um, Cleaners. Mm -hmm. So... She's, she's attached, she's producing two other films that I've got um, going in the next year or so. I love her. She's, a, she's just, she's one of my favorite people, but also one of my favorite producers because producers can be a little bit dramatic. They can come in and they can be, ah, the world's on fire, the sky's falling down. Um, and then you, then you get more stressed on set. You're like, oh God, oh. And Anne comes in and she's like, "How's it going?" I'm like, "Oh, good, good. Yeah, no, I know. We'll, you know, we'll get there. We'll make the day." And she goes, "Yeah, it's looking great." I'm like, "Oh, yeah, cool." I, I say to her, "Is everything going? You know, how's everything on your end?" Because she's, you know, she's running the military operation behind the scenes, and she's like, "Yeah, all good. Oh, cool, cool, cool." And then that night we'd go and have a wine and and we'd have a chat and we'll have a debrief, and the, the shit that she tells me that she's had to do during the day. You know, one day we got, when we did cleaners, we got raided by police because they thought we had all weapons. It was all fake weapons because we had this war room of weapons in one of the scenes. And we got raided and we almost got shut down until they realized we had licenses for this and blah, blah, blah. And she didn't tell me because if she told me that, then I'm stressing that we're going to get shut down and I'm not going to finish. That's why I love her. That's just a little sidebar. I mean, her emotional range is, a smile. She's like Mona Lisa. I call her Mona Lisa. She's always got this. She's always got this little smile that you don't know is good or bad. It's like, hmm, okay. Uh, so, Chick Fight was a script that came to Anne and I, and we we really responded to. For me, it, it read like Bridesmaids meets Fight Club. So I I really responded to that. I I just done a very female driven TV show with cleaners, and I I, I have nothing but admiration for so many um, female actors who are very dear friends of mine and I really want to always love to work with them and so you know chick fight sort of bounced around I got busy so I got had I, it got put on the back burner a little bit and then it kind of as projects do they kind of they they shift down as others shift up and then all of a sudden that one comes up because the piece falls into place um, that's why I have so much stuff in in product in in the works because you throw it all against the wall and stuff peels off. It's like those, you know, those sticky things. Yeah. You know, you throw it against the wall and it falls and you go, oh, that's going nowhere. Okay. But it's still sticking at the bottom. You're like, oh, it's holding on. And then other stuff just sticks. And you're like, all right, that's, that's going to happen next. So you, but if, you, if you throw one thing against the wall, you're like, you're, you're putting too many, you know, eggs in one basket. So Chick Fight slowly rose to the top. And then, then I, you know, I, I got the script into a into a place where I was happy with it that I approached Marlon Ackham, who is a very dear friend of mine, one of the close girlfriends who I love and adore as a person, as a mother, as a talent. She's just a brilliant actress. And uh, we, we wanted to find something to do together again. So I took her this and she responded. She attached herself. That's a big piece of the puzzle, getting getting your, your leading lady. Then it sort of went to the point of um, uh, the financier was able to start making offers to actors. And, you know, the next piece was getting someone like a, uh, an Alec Baldwin. Bella, Bella came on. Bella was a good get. I think we, I had a phone call with her and we, 
we got her on board. And then the final piece of the puzzle was we went to multiple actors. We had Nicolas Cage attached. He, he really wanted to do it. And he, they started to do his deal. And then he just, he, I think something else came up or they couldn't feel it. We went to another. Was he Alec or? For the same role. Yeah, for the same role. And then, uh, you know, a lot of really interesting, fun, cool, great actors. And then someone was like, oh, you know, Alex. I'm like, oh, my God, he's the best of them all. Like, this is incredible. And I was in Paris at the time. It was around November last year. And and Anne's like, can you get on the phone with Alec? He's he's, he's keen to chat. I'm like, "Uh, yeah, 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 of course. So, you know, then the next thing is you're, you're talking to Alec and he's like, I, I can't talk very, I'm not going to try and do his voice, but it's like, I can't talk very long. I can't talk very long. You know, I'm taking my kids to the, to the hairdresser. So he's, you know, he's a great dad. He's like, here's Alec Baldwin talking to me on the phone while his kids are in the barber or getting a haircut. And um, he's like, yeah, no, I like this. I like this, but you know, can you change it? I'm like, sure. Yeah. If you're interested, of course. So we had a quick chat about what he liked and didn't like. And I, I did a bit of a, I did a bit of a, you know, a page document about what I would change for that character, which was pretty much everything. And then he responded and then I wrote the scenes. And then I was in Paris because I have got a TV show set up in France. And then I was working on that. And then at night working on these, on these pages, furiously hoping that they would, they would get Alec on board. I sent them back. And then, then we had to, I had to fly back to, to LA and I was hoping I was told by the time I would land, we'd have an answer about whether he was in. So I got, you know, I got, I landed, you know, I put my phone on straight away and all these messages are coming up. Bing, bing, it's my wife. Have you landed? Miss you? Well, I'm like, oh yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, it got, to, it got to, it got to Anne and my producer and it was like, it looks like Alex in. I'm like, so anyway, so then you're, then you're kind of off to the races. Then you're, um, then it was a mad scramble to to cast the rest. We knew we were going to shoot in Puerto Rico because of the tax breaks and all that. Oh, um, so yeah. Great. So yeah, I was in. I was in, we, it was, we shot early December. I was there on December fourth, and we started a very short prep. And then, of course, in prep, you know, anything that can go wrong does go wrong. Losing locations, losing actors, losing this that. But look, we we accumulated. Weren't you there the for most, the earthquake too? What's that? Weren't you there for the earthquake too? Yeah, we're there for all those earthquakes. I mean, my wife and my family, we got moved out from place because we lost power. It's almost like Puerto Rico's run on one power grid. You know those? those they are. They, they are. Yeah, you know, it's like the entire country's plugged into one socket. Um, that poor place, boy. I love. I love the people. I love the place. I've got such. A, I've shot my second season of Cleaners there. I've such mad love and respect for them that those poor people have been through it. And then, yeah, the worst hur- the worst uh, earthquakes in a hundred years. We that was all in our preparation, so we weren't sure whether we were going to get to to shoot, but we did. Um, and then, yeah, we accumulated this incredible cast. Um, not only Marlon, Bella, Ali. Fortune Feimster, who's just the most wonderful comic. I love her. Um, and Kevin, Dulce, Kevin, who I didn't know. I love Dulce, Dulce Sloan, who was a she real was discovery. Fabulous. Fabulous. She was a, she was a real oh, discovery right. for me because she's the, you know, she's the lead with Marlon. She's the best yeah. friend. She's the, she's the scene stealer. You know, she's the one for me that was, this is Melissa McCarthy in Bridesmaids. If we find the right actor for this, we, you know, we could, this could be a real, breakout role and Dulce just grabbed the bull by the horns and she ran with it and she was brilliant. And I discovered her, you know, Is she um, a comic? Ash, so Ash Christian, who was one of our producers who, you know, God rest his soul, uh, died not long ago. He passed away. And so the film chick fight is actually dedicated to him. Um, Ash has produced Sorry a lot of my material. That. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful man. Uh, you'd love a lot of the movies he's produced too. You should look up some of his stuff. Ash um, No, Ash, Ash Christian. Christian. I'm going to write it down. Ash Christian. Um, so Ash kept, we, he, and, he and I made it our mission to really find someone interesting and different and not a name for that role. So we, we went, he kept coming to me in the mornings going, check out this stand-up. And we would look at up stand-up comedians and, 
And Dulce was a she's a correspondent on the Daily Show with Trevor Noah. Oh. Um, so you may know her from there, and she's brilliant on that. But I looked at her stand up, and she did one. She did she was really popular. I found out in Australia. So she, she did the Melbourne Comedy Festival, and I was looking at her stand up there. I'm like, oh, man, I became obsessed. I'm like, we've got to make this happen, Ash. Get on the phone. Do what has to. I want to get on the phone with Dulce, get her. I need to. She's like, he's like, slow your roll. <laughs> Isn't that just like? So finally, he goes, I've got your call with Dulce. She really likes the script. I'm like, done. I'll, 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 you know. So I get on the phone. I chat with her for about an hour. You know, clearly I love to talk. I mean, this has been going. I should, you know. I know. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we chatted about the role, and she, she was brilliant. And she just, she nailed it. So yeah, then we got Kevin Nash to play. I won't give away the type of role he's playing in the movie because it's a very different departure for Kevin. You know, a WWE Hall of Fame wrestler. Oh, who, yeah, you know, yeah. One, one I, I was thinking, because isn't um, the other guy Kevin too? Yeah, Kevin Connolly Kevin. from, from yeah, Under yeah. so That's who I yeah. thought you meant. But no, I now yeah. I know who you're talking about. Yeah. Great yeah. role. Great yeah. role. Um, Dominique so, Jackson from Pose. Yeah, so Dominique, and look, and, and Dominique was in the movie more, but, you know, again, she's brilliant in the film, but, you know, again, for time, for trying to truncate a story. This movie doesn't, the first cut of the movie was around a, an hour and 50 minutes, and I loved that cut. It was great. But this type of movie can't live at an hour and 50 minutes. That's, that's drama length. This is a fun movie. Yeah. This is a, a movie where you sit, you turn your brain off. You don't think about COVID for a, for a hot second, yeah. and you just you have a laugh. You just you know, it's not it's not going to be up for any Oscars. But I really hope it is just a distraction. It's got a fun, it funny great message. It started. It was funny hey? from the minute it started. Oh, good. You know, and again, you know, it's not. It's just it's light. You're going to get to the end of it, and you're going to go. That I had a fun time. That was fun. The fights look great. The girls are kick ass in them. It's got a really good message. Um, it's uh, those fights yeah. have to be the hardest shit to do. Well, yeah. I mean, all those fights, which were a lot, we had to shoot in the fight club in like six days or something. It was really tough. It was a tough schedule that for you as a director. Yeah. I mean, I know you're not Corey, but you know the. The stunt people are choreographing that, but you no, you, I mean, you are chore. Look, I, I got Shauna Galligan, who was the fight stunt coordinator, who I only met for this. She came on quite late, um, and she done. She, you know, she's doubled. She's doubled actors like Brie Larson for, for for Captain Marvel, and she she doubled one of the other actors in. So she was on the Avengers for years because she's an amazing stunt woman, and she was starting to get into choreography. I met her through another producer who I was working with on another one of my projects. I talked to Shauna on the phone. I'm like, I really wanted a female fight coordinator. She loved the material. She, we got along great guns. So she came to Port and she kept sending me, so she would choreograph some fights you know, as scripted, and then she would send them to me. On the, I'm like, ah, oh, these are amazing. And we can continue to fine tune them when you get here. So in pre-production, pre you know, Sean is having to find time to steal with the actors, to teach them these fights, to get the stunt girl. And it's, it was a lot. So it was a, it's really difficult. And um, we got the most amazing stunt doubles for Marla Nackerman and Bella, um, Bella Thorne, um, Emily and Holly. They are just the most incredible. These girls, I just, I'm in awe. Literally, I'm in awe of stunt people in general. I, that's why I do a lot of action stuff because I just like, they're my heroes, you know. The female stunt girls are just, they just throw themselves around and they just take these hits and they they just, they, they hit the mat. And I'm like, oh, God, every, after every take, I'm like, I'm running up to them. You're all right. I'm, you're, I'm, and they're, I'm, then they're like, yeah, Paul, we're fine. I, I forget. I, I don't need to baby you. You guys are just, you guys are tougher, way tougher than me. And they get up and then they go home and they're wearing their high heels and they're beautiful. I'm like, they're ladies. They're so you know, feminine. And yet in the ring and in, on set, they are just badass. It's amazing. I love it. Yeah. So, yeah. 
Um, and, and I have to say, just in case anybody doesn't know, Malin Ackerman, who's the star of the movie, my husband introduced me to her. I didn't really know her until the comeback. When the season two of the comeback, Baby Girl, she's brilliant in that. Yeah. And brilliant. She's brilliant. And she's, she's an amazing comic. Oh. Her sense, of, her sense of timing, her sense of yeah. just place, you know, like she knows what she's doing. She's And she, she, she was my coach. She produced this as well. So she was my co-general, you know. And every day on set, she was like just with me. We're like in the trenches together. And I just, I had a wing, wing woman, a wingman. Like she would like, you know, not only did I get to do this with one of my besties, like we just, she just had my back. I had hers and she's so funny. And that is her in real life. She's just, again, you know, I've, I've, I've been lucky enough. I've been lucky in some of the stuff I've directed to work with, with dear friends. Um, Emmanuel Shriki, who was in Entourage for many years, she was my leading one of my leads on um, on Cleaners. She's in the same group of friends as Marlon, and we just it's so I'm so lucky to get to work with these girls and to go to work with with dear friends and create and have fun. So it's it's it's, well, it's, it's yeah, that's it's, amazing. Well, mm. Paul, I am so excited for your success, my friend. It, it really oh, is. cheers, mate. Amazing, you, buddy. And, and the movie opens November thirteenth, and it's yeah, in it opens November thirteenth in North in North America, um, in you know in um, you know Canada or in America. It's in select theaters, whatever that means these days. Um, not much, no one's really going to the cinemas, right. so it's it's on it's on demand. So all the iTunes and all that you can get it. And, um, you know, same I think uh, in the theaters, same day in the theaters yeah. and on yeah. demand. Yeah, so come November 13th, we're all going to need a laugh no matter what happens. Um, <laughs> after after the upcoming election. No, no. So, let's just, yeah. so look, so every, everyone just November 13th, crack open some wine, just sit back. And the good thing about this is a really female driven movie. So the, you know, girls and women alike are going to love it. But it's also because of the action. Every, all the, you know, guys I've shown it to, be within my family or my inner circle when I was editing. They love it too because it's just I like, oh, this is this is great. Look at these fights. This is these are these are as good I, as any I, fights I've seen with men. Yeah. I, I was so, blown away by the fights and that's why I was asking about the choreography. That's yeah. incredible. And so for well, everyone else, for everyone else in Europe and, and worldwide, it's gonna it's gonna get a uh, I think a, a worldwide release through a big streamer, which I can't announce just yet. Because I'm, I'm not sure whether I can, but it, it will get a worldwide release within after 60 days of being having an exclusive in America. Have you gone over to Holland while you've been so close? We're right next door, and I just haven't had a chance. With I, I'm working on another movie right now for a studio, and and uh, so I'm I've been in the trenches rewriting this script to direct it next year, early next year. Um, and yeah, no, you know I love Amsterdam. It's right next door. Um, well, and, I was asking uh, the, the Dutch who were watching were asking if you had come. All right, I, 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 I've, got, I've, I've got to go, but I'm going to leave you with one Dutch. Story. Yeah, that's great. It's pretty funny. When I was on the show, I think I was on my like it was on this. I'd done my three years, and I was on that final stint when I came back to do the other six months. I think that had just wrapped. Anyway, I was in Amsterdam on a ho on a vacation with a girlfriend at the time. And, um, you know, we were walking around Amsterdam and you know, I was getting a few looks here and there because I, I, I came to understand that, that As the World Turns was quite popular in, in Holland. Um, so anyway, I was walking. We found ourselves in the red light district, as you do, just wandering and walking yeah. around. And I'm like, wow, this is crazy. There's all these women in these windows and people go window shopping. That's interesting. That's, that's fun, unique. Anyway. I was walking past, and I was, you know, arm around my girlfriend and like chatting and all of a sudden there was about three girls in these windows who looked at me and were like tapping on the glass. I'm like, Jesus, what's going on? Is there? And then two of them ran out and came running up and they were like, Simon, Simon. <laughs> and all these other tourists and other people around were like, oh, that poor guy. He's with his wife or his girlfriend and all these hookers that he's been with are running after him. <laughs> that, that must be so embarrassing. 
And I was like, mm. anyway. <laughs> that is a great way to end. Stay so, that was, in a second. Paul, so good to see you, my friend. Thank you for doing this. Pleasure. And uh, thank you, everyone, for watching. Uh, and stay safe. Much love to all. And uh, Alan, good luck for... Uh, yeah, Chick Fight Open 13. And, and Alan, good luck with this, mate. I really, I'm really proud of you for doing this. And it's, it's a lot of fun. And uh, I reckon you're going to do great. I uh, hope so. I'll say goodbye to you in a second, Polly. Bye, everybody. Bye, mate.